In my last video, I talked about five different ways to optimize your Plex Media server. These were tips and tricks to basically make what you have run just a little bit faster or potentially add the right hardware to get the best possible performance upgrades for your dollar. But in today's video, let's talk about five different ways people mess up building their first Plex Media server. What's up YouTube, Jason here with Bite My Bits. In today's video, I wanna focus more on the hardware side of Plex. There's always different things that you can do when you're setting up the software portion of your Plex media server, things that you end up doing and you realize was either the wrong way or not the most optimized way, but those are usually things that you can go back and kind of tweak or change and fix without having to spend a ton of money or any money on new or additional hardware. Now I've built a few Plex servers in my time and there have been a few mistakes that I've made along the way. Now, whether I made those mistakes on purpose due to budget reasons or just ignorance, either way, I wanted to share some of those with you. So hopefully if you are thinking of building your own very first Plex media server, you can avoid some of the headaches, hassles, and costly adventures that I endured while I built my first server. Now, if you've already initially built your server, everything's running great, but you want to find ways to optimize it, I definitely recommend watching my five ways to optimize that server. So let's jump on in. Number one, top on my list is going to be RAM. A lot of times when you're building out a server, especially if you are an enthusiast like I am, you may or may not think that you need all of the RAM in the world. You're just going through your PC part builder. It's like, how much RAM do you want? And you click yes. And that is actually one of the first things that I did when I built my first media server. I'm like, throw a bunch of RAM in it because RAM makes things better, right? Wrong. Surprisingly enough, Plex actually does not require a ton of RAM. In fact, you can run a perfectly great performing Plex media server, depending on your operating system, little asterisks here with like eight gigs of RAM. I would not recommend eight gigs of RAM because again, depending on your operating system, there is some headroom there that you have to be able to, you know, consider. So me personally, from an enthusiast standpoint, I would say 16 gigabytes of RAM is probably the bare minimum that you want to run. However, eight is still definitely doable, especially if you're running something like Unraid. It's just really low RAM usage and Plex isn't going to use that much. So it's just one of those things. If you don't have the money and you're trying to find ways to buy more hard drives or a better GPU or CPU or something like that, RAM is always an option to do a budget cut on. I know, Dude, you just I know, about listen, I'm, I'm getting to, I know, but you just said, yes, thank you. Now I know what you might be thinking, but Jason, you said yourself, RAM transcoding is a great way to optimize your Plex media server. I've watched your videos. You said transcode to RAM, everything's better and greater and faster. And that is technically true. And if you wanna build your Plex media server to do RAM transcoding, I personally would recommend, again, depending on your usage, probably a minimal of 32 gigabytes of RAM. If you can afford it, you can bump that up slightly to 128, but you definitely wanna make sure you have enough RAM <laughs> Yes, that was a joke. Okay, bump it up to 64, whatever. But either way, it depends on your usage. How many transcoded streams at the same time are you planning on half? Are they going to be 4K transcoded streams, which you really shouldn't do? Are you doing high quality 1080p streams? Maybe it's a higher bit rate. I would just try to allocate at least half a gig to one and a half gigs per stream of transcoded media that you plan on using with your server if you want to use RAM transcoding. Yes, those are bigger numbers than what you're probably ever going to use. But again, enthusiasts, I like to, to overcompensate with RAM. Which by the way, I do fully endorse support RAM transcoding. I think it is a great thing for everybody to set up if you have the hardware capable of doing it. However, I think from a speed standpoint, even though you do gain probably a little bit of speed, there's really not a ginormous difference in speed from using, let's say RAM versus SSD. Because at the end of the day, your hard drive is still a bottleneck. It still has to be able to grab this information. It still has to be able to pull the media file from a spinning platter of rust. So, you know, whatever medium you're using in order to transcode that to, albeit it does make a difference, there's not going to be this huge difference between an SSD and a RAM transcoding setup. And well, let's just be honest, SSDs are a heck of a lot cheaper than RAM is. So, you know, that's just something budget wise, you may not want to waste your money on a bunch of RAM unless you intend on using it. Another asterisk here, I can hear you screaming in the back, 
Yes, if you plan on using your server for other things, VMs, whatnot, you wanna be able to plan for that with additional RAM. But this is just for Plex. So number two, too old of a graphics card and or a graphics card with too little RAM. Plex is amazing. It supports hardware accelerated transcoding. I think you still need a Plex pass for that. If you sign up for that, use my links in the description down below. But Plex uses hardware accelerated transcoding. If you have a graphics card, you can offload a lot of that weight from your CPU over to your graphics card. There's a lot of asterisks here. If you got consumer cards, you might have to driver hack them. If you get a Quadro, then it's going to work great, but it's going to be super expensive. Ignoring all of that, if you get a graphics card that is too old, it may not be able to support most of the media that you have on your server. So if you run out and you get this amazing deal on something like a 650 or 750 Ti, you're going to realize that it may not support half of the content literally that you're trying to watch with it. So even though you put it in there, it's consuming power, you go to load it up, you're transcoding, and your CPU is still doing all of the work because your graphics card is too old. I will link in the description down below an NVIDIA graphics card support matrix that will actually break down the different capabilities of each graphics card. There's gonna be things like H.264, 4K, H.265, etc. But the safe bet here is at bare minimum, stick with at least a nine series. But I personally wouldn't go with anything older than a 10 series. And of course, everyone's favorite P2000, which supports almost everything except the RTX 4000, and supports just a little bit more. I, I got one of those cards. God, I really need to make a video on that. And to add on top of all of that, if you get a card that only has something like, let's say two gigs of RAM, you might run into issues just from the VRAM. The reason being, again, RAM transcoding, when you're using your graphics card to transcode things, especially 4K content, which again, you shouldn't do, but 4K content can take up to 1.5 gigabytes worth of VRAM each just to transcode a 4K stream. Knock that down about three to 400, maybe 500 megs per 1080p stream. Again, a lot of variables here. I'm just throwing this out here. If you get this card that technically possibly could handle six or seven streams, but only has enough RAM to do three or four of them, then what's the point? So if you're shopping for a card, at least go for a 10 series and go for something with at least four gigs of RAM or more. Yes, it's gonna cost you a little bit more money, but in the long run, you're gonna be able to get more usage out of said graphics card. Numero el treso. I know, just let's roll with it. Hard drive expansion, future planning. This is something I personally have ran into multiple times where you buy something, fits your needs, everything works good, you get a little bit of an expansion in there and then you realize you wanna add more hard drives and you have absolutely no way to do it because you're completely out of space. And that sucks because then you have to rebuild everything, buy a new case and you have to make room because you did not plan ahead. For this, I actually recommend a case, something like the Rosewill, I think it's, I'm just gonna call it the 4000 series. I don't remember the exact SKU, the product code on it, but the Rosewell case literally has one that's like 15 hot swappable bays, another one that has like, I think it's 15 or 20 internal bays, but these are anywhere between 100 to $200 cases that literally just give you so much room to grow. So even if you're starting with, let's say two or five hard drives, it gives you so much room to add in more storage space. And you don't have to run out and rebuild your server because you just don't have anywhere to put hard drives. And please, for the love of anything that you take holy, do not take a hard drive and set it on top of your case. That is the worst possible thing you could do for your hard drive. Yes, it'll technically work for a little bit, but hard drives hate vibrations, and that is the best way to kill your hard drive. Just don't do it, unless it's a Seagate, in which case it's gonna die anyway, so it doesn't really matter. But just don't abuse your hard drives, okay, people? Please, just don't but plan for the future and try to spend a few extra bucks to get a case that you can actually grow into that's not going to limit your future hard drive expandability. Number four, and I've made this mistake before and now I'm like totally on it and I can't say this enough, backup battery. Now you may or may not be living in an area that has power issues. This could be anything from the poor people in California that like suffer blackouts and earthquakes and forest fires and like just anything. Like if a, a mosquito farts, their power goes down for four hours over there in California. Here in Kansas, we have like 20 to 50 mile an hour wind on a daily basis. So our power flickers. Maybe you have stable power, maybe you don't, but all it takes is one single power flicker or power outage when your server is in the middle of doing something that can corrupt your database 
database, corrupt your media storage files, corrupt your entire array of hard drives that you have set up. Or for that matter, it could actually like fry your motherboard and completely ruin your server altogether. But that is just a whole nother thing. The point is, is that if you don't have any kind of power backup, it doesn't matter how small of a battery backup, as long as it is capable of handling that running that server long enough in order to shut it down in the case of a power outage, it is going to do wonders for the long-term survivability of your Plex media server. I mean, literally a UPS could be anywhere from like 80 bucks to like 150 bucks for some of the most basic power protection for your server. A lot of people overlook that because it doesn't add any performance. It doesn't give them anything. They don't gain anything when they plug it in. All it does is give them a peace of mind. But that one power surge or power outage, and then next thing you know, you're fighting server problems, your Plex media database is ruined, your OS has all of your arrays all screwed up and you're rebuilding stuff. And the next thing you know, you know, cats are roaming the streets with AK-47s taking over the world because they magically evolved into, you know, a superior species, probably because of aliens. I mean, all of this can happen if you don't get a UPS backup power supply. So always back up your power. Highly recommend it. I mean, cats, I don't, I don't even know where that came from. I think I have like a, a deep fear of cats taking over the world with the assistance of aliens now. That's really weird. Number five, and this is another kind of a weird thing, but something has happened to me. It's happened to people I know. People ask me. I've had this pop up more times than I would like to admit, and that is SATA cables or anything connected to SATA. I know, just bear with me. Throughout my journey of building and managing Plex Media servers, I have had hard drive errors. I've had hard drive issues. I know people that constantly have said things like, I'm getting these errors on my hard drives. I'm getting this issue of things dropping out or not popping up or just whatever. And the first thing anyone wants to jump to is, oh my God, my hard drive is bad. What's going on? I got to replace this. I mean, how is this possible? I bought a brand new Seagate. There's no way this thing could completely fail out of the box immediately. My point is, is that when I was building, especially my first Plex Media server, I was just pulling old sat of cables I had out of an old box of cables. I plugged those in, thought everything should be good. I had all these kind of issues. And then I just, I swapped the SATA cable and then everything worked better. I've had issues where hard drives weren't popping up. And I, I just, I rattled in my brain thinking, how in the world is this hard drive bad now? And it was just good five minutes ago. Lo and behold, I was reaching in there and fiddling with stuff and I just accidentally halfway unplugged it. Maybe I have four or five bad hard drives and all of those are plugged into a SATA PCI expansion card and that card itself is going bad, needs a firmware update or whatever. Basically the point is if you think you have issues with a hard drive, the first thing you should do to diagnose this is to use a different SATA cable and or plug it into a different SATA port and then run your test again. This could very well save you a bunch of time and money from you running out and buying a whole new hard drive or dealing with the RMA process of any hard drive company because all you had was a bad connection to the hard drive from your computer. And if you're really into this, thank you Scuba for recommending me say this on video. You can buy one of those little toasters. It's like a little hard drive, USB 3.0 connected. It looks like a little toaster. You put a drive in there. You can put your drives in there and you can test them and see if there's any errors using this little toaster. And it's all hot swappable. It's very, I'll link to one in the description down below that I actually use more often than I'd probably like to admit. Usually these little toaster hard drive things don't care if your hard drive needs a third pin or anything like that. They just work. You plug them in, they work for hard drives, they work for SSDs, it allows you to, you know, read and write from those hard drives, it allows you to run tests on them. I mean, they're amazing little devices and they're like 15, 20 bucks and those things are just awesome. So thank you Scuba for recommending that, but that is definitely something that you want to check out if you're getting into this whole Plex hard drive data hoarder thing, whatever, having something that you can just easily plug into that's USB connected is highly recommended. And I feel like I have to add in an honorable mention here. I, I, I talked about this, I think a little bit with my Plex optimization. And I first, I didn't want to add this to my list because I feel like everybody already knows this. This is like given knowledge to know this, but as an honorable mention, let's say a little shadow number six added to this list, SSDs. I mean, come on, if you know that running your windows off of a hard drive and then you upgrade that to an SSD and all of a sudden it's like you're at warp speed versus impulse speed, like you already know SSDs are magical when you compare them to the speed of a hard drive. 
but running your Plex metadata, and I'm talking about your meta data, not your media storage stuff. I'm talking about your meta data. If you run your metadata from an SSD, your Plex media server is going to be infinitely faster than what it would be if it was running off of a hard drive. I know it's kind of a given, but I feel like it has to be said just for that one person out there that just like has a two terabyte, you know, drive that they're running all of the Plex data off of. I, I just, Come on, just get an S SSDs are so cheap. You can get one for like 60 bucks, especially if you have a small little, you know, library thing going on. You can get like a $50 SSD. You might need to run backups on that SSD because it could fail, but still SSDs are cheap and is like the best, cheapest, most bang for your buck way of speeding up your Plex media server if you are currently using a hard drive for all of your Plex metadata. So that's it for today, guys. That is five. Yeah, it was actually six. Yes. Five, six different ways that people have screwed up, messed up, and cost themselves times or money when building a Plex media server that you should avoid if you are planning on building a Plex media server. I look forward to all of your comments in the section down below telling me things that you messed up during your first Plex media server build, things you learned from it, and what you did to change it. So leave those in the comments down below. As always, thank you for watching, like, and subscribe below, and have yourself a great day.